Hey guys, I thought I'd do a twist on the classic owl bear. Today we are going to be using a snowy owl as inspiration for our classic owl bear. Hopefully you guys enjoy what you're seeing on screen, and if you do, please stay tuned because we will be showing you how to do this very shortly. So, arguably owl bears are one of the core staples of D&D, uh, with a challenge rating of, well, three, which makes it great for low-level parties, but also great as a pet for a high-level party. It's a pretty versatile creature, and honestly, I wanted to do this model justice by doing a paint scheme on it I hadn't really seen before. So we decided to go with a snow owl approach, and what better sculpt to use than the new current Owl Bear from Reaper Bones Black? So Reaper Bones Black is 50% of the original Reaper Bones style plastic mixed with a harder type plastic, or at least that's how it's been explained to me. And it's honestly one of the best sculpts that Reapers put out in a while. Hopefully you guys agree with what I decided to do and what my approach was, and get on with the tutorial. So I have gone ahead and just primed with Corax White and Wraithbone White. Wraithbone where I want my shadows to be, mostly because this is going to be a pretty bright model and I figured a cream color would work great for the shadows. Now, Apothecary White, not my favorite contrast paints. To be honest, contrast paints aren't really a good paint for beginners, however, in certain aspects like today, where we're just going to be covering the entire surface of the model with the paint, it'll work just fine. So first things first, we're going to be using a large flathead brush. Uh, anything around a quarter of an inch should be fine. We just want to get the entire surface of this model covered with the apothecary white, and we want to try to keep it from pooling off the base, as that'll make painting things later on a little bit more, well, easy. So you just want to go ahead, load up your brush, and just kind of get a nice even layer across everything. We want to avoid pooling and if it does start to pool, just keep manipulating with it and playing with it and moving it around until you get it where you need it to be. The goal of this level is simply to just, again, put an even coat across everything. We want to get a nice gray base tone across everything. This contrast paint really helps to keep the Wraithbone cream color as a nice darker base as comparative to the Corax White. So once it's all said and done, there's some secret you know next level shading going on in the background there and that's what's taking place whether your eye realizes it's there or not now you'll notice as we continue to paint the model uh, I don't really try to do a lightweight look or a transparent look in the wings and this is mostly because I feel that an owlbear's wing's sole goal is to generate gusts of wind for attacks it's not necessarily meant for gaining flight. I don't know of any owl bears at all in D&D that can actually fly, so I'm not going to be trying to give them a light arid look. I'm wanting them to be robust and I want them to look strong. So that's why you'll see me painting a solid white tone in the next stage across the wings as well as across the body. So moving right along, you want to start with whatever white you've got available to you. You want to get the purest white that you can, and we're going to be using, again, a large brush, uh, preferably around a quarter inch wide flat brush, and then we are going to basically do a dry brush across the entire surface. However, unlike a typical dry brush where you want to go kind of light-handed, this is a bit more ham-fisted of a dry brush. We're not quite doing an overbrush. But we definitely want to make sure that as we work our way around the model that we are going out of our way to leave that gray tone that we've just spent all this time working on in the recesses. However, we do also want to make sure that plenty of that raised uh, surface detail is preserved in the white that we are now adding. So if we are to think of the deepest recesses as being a base level, uh, you want to use cover the mid-tone and the high tones in the white and this will create a very nice depth in color as you will soon see.
So as we begin to work here with the black, adding in the shapes that you would see typically with a snowy owl, we are primarily working with the wings here first, and we kind of want to make a crescent-like shape when we are applying this effect. And as I was looking at reference photos, which I would love to show you, unfortunately I don't own the rights to, so if you want to go ahead and just Google search, you'll see for yourself. Their markings typically end up being more of a crescent or like a wiggly line. It's kind of hard to describe. But we want to leave a little bit of the white showing at the bottom of the feather when we make our first crescent shape. And then we basically want to draw a line all the way across from one side of the wing to the other with crescent shapes. Again, leaving just a little bit of white along the bottom of the wing. Uh, we then want to come back in around the halfway mark between where the first line is and where the next set of feathers are, and that's where we're going to put our second set of lines. Continuing along with the rest of the wing, we basically want to draw a crescent shape around the halfway point between the remaining feathers on the wing. This is mostly because there just quite isn't enough space to add two sets of lines, and we want to create this pattern shape that's going to go all the way across the back, as you will see later on. So this is a good spacing to keep going for later, and will make our lives a little bit easier. Moving right along, we're going to be working on his tail now. Now, because of the size of the feathers, we're going to be just putting the crescent shape right in the middle of all of the feathers, except for the four in the middle at the lowest point on his body. So the one I'm doing right now, we're going to go ahead and put that crescent with a little bit of white at the bottom, and then at the halfway point between where the next set of feathers are and the original black mark at the bottom. And that's how we're going to do those. And then again, like I said, the rest of these are just going to get a mark right in the middle. So these crescent shapes that you see on the back of a snow owl, that's what we're going to be doing now. I'm going to leave his spine solid white, that, that little raised edge down the middle of his back. And then starting in the shoulder region and kind of almost going to a 45 degree angle down the arm, I'm just going to do these crescent wavy line shapes. Um, and basically the goal is that the spacing between them should be roughly equal to the spacing that we put on the wings and we want the uh, wings to line up with the markings on his back. In addition to the markings that I'm putting on the arms and his back, I am going to be putting a little bit underneath his armpit in the rib cage area, leading all the way down to the legs. And we are going to leave the belly white, or that grayish off-white that we've painted the whole model. And this is simply because on a real snowy owl, most of the pictures that I could find the belly is either almost a golden color or a pure white. So we are just going to go ahead and not put any marks on his chest.
Now with the crest or hood of the head, I am just putting in some dots and I'm using my reference image to show me about how far down the face and on the neck that this would go. And on most snowy owls, it appears that it's just this dot pattern. There doesn't seem to be any real formation like there is on the rest of the body. So I just leave it simple as that. So one of the last steps you can see me doing here is I'm going ahead and I'm blacking out its feet. I'm also going to be blacking out the palms of its hands and all the way up to its knuckles on the backs of its hands as well as its beak. I'm not going to black out the inside of the ears, although I feel you could if you wanted to. Personally, I want to paint those the same color as what I end up painting the inside of its mouth, which is an off pink. Now this next step is kind of optional. I am going in with a dark gray. This is Skaven Blight Dinge, I believe is how you say it. You could skip this step. It's more or less a primer for the Dawnstone color that we'll be adding next. Basically, you want to do a dry brush on the palms of the hands, the backs of the knuckles, the tops of the claws, its beak, and the tops of the claws on its feet. And that's really all you need to cover for this tone before we move on to Dawnstone. Moving right along with the Dawnstone color, we basically want to edge highlight both the back of the claws and the inside edge of the claws. We don't necessarily want to highlight the sides. You can also add a little dot along the tops of each of the knuckles as well as in the pads of the hand. You can see there's quite a bit of detail there. You just want to add a dot of color to each of the raised sections in the hand. So one on the inside of each knuckle, one on the inside edge of the thumb, and then there are two imprints for either side of the palm of the hand. And we just want to put that there on both hands. Next, we want to go ahead and right along the top of the claw and the first knuckle of the foot, go ahead and do the same thing as well as there's a claw on the back side of the foot and any raised surfaces along the side of the foot just hit the tops of those where the light would be exposed to it. Now when it comes to edge highlighting the beak you want to get the inside rim of the mouth on the top and bottom jaw as well as the crest of the beak itself and then you kind of want to do almost a triangle shape at the very tip of the beak to show some wear and tear as well as some age. Then we want to add just a little bit of white to that gray and we want to hit just the tip of the nose as you can see me doing here. I only go about two thirds of the way up the beak and then we want to get just the inside edge of the mouth. Again this is going to help to show some wear and tear and age. And we don't really even need to put any along the bottom jaw although before this is done I end up going just a little bit brighter with a pure white on the tip of the beak on the top and the bottom. You can also use this to add a little bit of extra detail to his claws, however I only recommend putting this on the outside edge of his claws and not necessarily the inside edge of his claws. And you want to focus this more on the leading edge where the light would be exposed to them, so try to keep this off the underside of the claws. As I moved into some of the final stages and the last little bit of cleaning things up, I decided that I wanted to go ahead and put some yellow in the eyes. I felt like this was a much needed pop of color and I noticed that a lot of the actual snow owls have a yellowish gold tinged eye. So I wanted to go ahead and bring that over into this. And this was going to mostly help me to decide if there was any last minute edge highlighting that I wanted to do. And I ended up deciding to do a mild glaze of yellow along the bottom edge of the eye to give almost like a magical effect. I plan on using this mostly as a monster or a magical monster in D&D as opposed to a companion animal, so I wanted to put a little extra spin on things. And there you have it folks. Uh, I have uh, mildly washed the surface with three different colors of brown, not super important which browns. And then I've used the same grays that we've used throughout the model to paint the rocks. Uh, I've nothing crazy, but at this point you basically are at the pass roads of 
do you want to base this with live grass? Do you want to base this with snow? It's entirely up to you. Personally, I'm going to be using snow to base mine, but that is just because of the environment that I think this would belong in, similar to a polar bear. Now, if you've done more of a traditional paint job, then maybe you want to do, you know, normal static grass or some of the sponge foam flock. But it is all up to you at the end of the day and we will cut back here in just a moment once I've got my flocking on this model. Once again guys, if you've enjoyed this tutorial, please leave a like or a comment. It really does help the channel to grow and it lets me know what you guys want to see in the future. If you didn't like this tutorial, then go ahead and hit that dislike. Again, it helps me to know what you guys want to see. If you really want to help see this channel grow, please feel free to share this around with your friends and any communities that you may be a part of. It really means the world to me. Thanks so much guys for watching, and as always, I hope your display case is always full and your pile of shame never empties. And until next time guys, I'll see you later.